Put that on the plate. Okay, now take your spouse on the plate. Now, um, the members of your family. Uh, your neighbor to your right, neighbor to your left, across the street, dry cleaner, pa pediatrician, doctor, dentist, and then I go through all the different people, and then the child that you're open, the type of placement you're open to. And we have <laughs> plates that have a whole lot of white and one black bead in the middle of it. And it's just a visual of, how do you think that's going to go? How would you feel if you were the black bead in the middle of the sea of white? And vice versa, too. And I've had African Americans' families come in and say that they, you know, they were open to vocation. And it was, it was just the, it was like the opposite of that. And, and you know, we talk about that. How, how can you incorporate diversity into your life? Okay, so what do you need to do in order to be an adoption sensitive counselor? What do you personally need to do? You need to examine your own personal thoughts, your own attitudes, your own beliefs around the adoption. Mm -hmm. um, because you need to be aware of potential sources of counter transplants. Especially when you're talking with someone who's making a decision on whether she's going to place a child or parent. It takes, you really have to think about your own stuff here in advance and what you might be bringing to the table. Um, you have to consider your own bias that you might have because, you know, lifetime movies about birth parents. Um, examine your feelings about <coughs> openness, whether you think this is such a good thing or not. And your feelings about race. So there's a lot that you need to look at to really to be able to be um, competent in, in dealing with people in this population. And to remember when you're working with members of the tribe that there is a lot of variability. So adoption experience is not a cookie cutter. Um, there's a big difference between domestic adoptions and international. Um, contact is a big part of the differences there. Transracial versus same sex. Um, be aware of all the cultural factors that you're already you know, being trained to be aware of. Same, same with adoption. Know your community resources for referrals. and. Um, Allow the clients to identify and experience their loss without minimizing it. You know, it's, it's going to be fine. It'll be fine. It'll all be. It'll all work out. It'll be, you know, it's, that's minimizing what they're going through. Mm -hmm. Best practices acknowledge that uh, the reality that the adopted child, you know, was relinquished and that there was a loss there, an early loss. Help the families develop a narrative, a birth story for, for all concerned. Um, normalize conversations about adoption. It shouldn't be something that's, you know, not comfortable bringing up. Uh, the other side of that is please, please don't suggest to families that they should have Sunday night adoption night. Okay, we're going to talk about your adoption every Sunday night. That just, it's bizarre. It's just contrived. So it just has to be a more, more natural kind of thing. Um, okay, so we have a couple of case studies. And what I'd like to do for 10 minutes is just maybe divide up in groups of I don't know, maybe six or eight. And then I'm going to give each of the group a case study. And then just kind of give your thoughts about what might be going on in this scenario. Imagine that this is, was presented to you. And we can talk about some of the, you know, some of the issues that might come up for these people with these studies and what your feelings might be about this. And there's no right or wrongs here. This is, you know, just kind of us discussing how would this go. These are actual cases, and I can tell you how they actually went. Um, but, we just kind of divide up into maybe groups of six or seven. Did you want this to the first one? Yeah, thank you. Yes. Because you guys have your cards, if you have any language cards. <laughs> Guys, one. Can I just turn around, maybe, and Laura, I'm not the one. Oh, <laughs> uh, here you go. Thank you for that side of the room. Two different ones. Uh, <laughs> we have uh, two different groups going on over here.
wherever they were placed, whether it's written by a her family or with the adoption agency, whatever it is, you know, um, you know, whether that report or her mm -hmm. um, But also, like, helping her have a realistic view of her, her um, birth parents, too, because it's easy to kind of polarize mm -hmm. them in this situation. So Excellent. Yeah. We did. One of the things we talked about is maybe like reframing for her, kind of posing the question like, why do you think your parents would keep this secret for so long? Like, what is it that they're afraid of that they, you know, and kind of like exploring that, and um, also exploring like the the lie that um, her one adopted brother is her biological brother, you know, and kind of does that change anything for you? You know, what does that bring up for you? And does it change the way you feel about your family or, you know, your interactions or anything like that? So, but validation was really big. Yeah. Uh, all of your your comments are dead on, really right on. First thing is to validate how she's feeling. Uh, now, she called this in, so what would you do? This was a phone call. Some of this information came out. So I, I got a phone call from her. And... Um, you know, I, she said that she was adopted, so the first thing that, that I would have to do then is to look back into the file, find the file, and, and I would pull her back. So that would be the first thing that all of you would have to do, would be, you know, first of all, happy birthday, your 18th birthday. I can appreciate it. It sounds like this is something you've been looking forward to doing. And, uh, you know, how is it that you knew that you had to wait till you were 18 to do this? And then she told me, oh, that's something I wanted to do for a while. I've, I've known I was adopted, you know. Not my whole life, part of my own. And uh, this is what I know. And um, I had to get back to her at that point. And I said, well, I will, I'm will. i happy to look you know, look up your file. Would you like to come in and meet with me and talk with me? Because this is kind of a big deal in your life. Don't you feel like it's a big deal? And she said, yeah, I do feel like it's a big deal. So I immediately set up an appointment for her to come in. Um, in the meantime, I did my research. and. Talk about feelings coming up. Fortunately, you know, you're able to do this not in the presence of the client. Because as I'm reading this, it was appalling to me that the agency seemed to care more about the placement fee than maybe what was in the best interest of everyone involved here. Um, and they seemed very judgmental of the birth family. A lot of judgments about the birth family. Um, and it's all written out in the notes. And interestingly enough, the notes, no one felt the any kind of need to kind of hide how they felt. It was very judgmental, um. just laid right out. Mm -hmm. So, you know, reading that and then seeing that book that was in the file that they had, <laughs> it really brought tears to my eyes. I mean, I was very moved by this story. And then, you know, allowed myself that time alone and then put my counselor hat back on and okay, how are we going to approach this case? Mm -hmm. So first thing is validate when she can validate how she's feeling. Find out how she's feeling and then validate how she's feeling. And and we have ha I've met with her on many, many occasions now. She's a regular client. <coughs> but um, we have discussed um, you know, perhaps what her parents' motivations were in waiting so long. We have discussed how does this change for you that your brother is not your biological brother? Actually, not neither of them are. Um, you know, how? what does your adoption status mean for you? And do you want to have information about your birth family? So, um, she did. So before I go into the next chapter of this, we have another group that had the same case, correct? Yes. Okay, so what, what was the impression that you guys had? Um, ours was pretty similar mm -hmm. to theirs. Um, we discussed the elements of like fear that maybe the parents had and wanting to share that information with the daughter who wanted to pr protect her in some you way. Mm -hmm. um, for whatever reason they had for doing that. Yeah. Um, also, just the deception, um, the, the lack of trust now on Jennifer's end with her Huge. family, her adopted, um, her family. Right. Um, uh, the other thing that um, was interesting was that the file notes indicated that contact could be made to the biological parents. Yes. But that was never, it doesn't sound like it was ever, that information was shared by mm -hmm. the, by Renee and Adam, the, her new 
I'm all getting tongue tied one day. That's, that's, right. and Adam. That's, that's correct. <laughs> And I'm trying to remember the names that were changed. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, I thought that was interesting too, that there was no notation that that was shared. Yeah. Um, that doesn't mean there wasn't, that it wasn't shared, but there wasn't a note in there that it had been shared. Um, so yes, so that information was there sitting in the file, that if this child came back and wanted information, it was okay to pass along the contact information. Yeah, I, I was wondering, were the adoptive parents kind of uh, almost basing some of the decisions on the idea that these are closed adoption records, so therefore Jennifer would not find out? Because mm -hmm. we were, I, I think we were all really struck by you know, the secrets and the deception. You know, why, um, why did they do that? And, right. You know, Actually, you know, not in this case. Uh -huh. Because the, the file did show that there was they're, they were open, they said they were open to having some, mm -hmm. some level of contact. They just didn't live up to that. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. That's so sad. That's very sad. Mm -hmm. The other thing that was involved here were feelings that possibly this uh, adoptive family, I'm going to use it for identifying purpose, right? <laughs> so the adoptive family may have had feelings of certainly fear, but guilt. Mm -hmm. I mean, now they parented this child and they're looking back and they know what happened back there. So maybe they cut off ties for fear that these people are really going to try to take this baby back. Right, so that's a real possibility there. The really weird thing about the file is that it was noted in the file that the birth father, when they refused to give this child back to the birth family, the birth father said, and I quote, our daughter will find us on her 18th birthday. I got chills all through my body, but I'm reading it, oh my God. How weird is that? So the follow up on this is that um, the phone number didn't work. Oh, wow. So then what do we do for our clients? Like, where do, where do, where's the line? Do we advocate for them? This is something that's important for her. It was clearly important for them. But they haven't called us with the new number. So what do we do? Look them up on Facebook. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly right. I look people up on Facebook. Do you really? Yes, I do. Oh, my goodness. Yes, I do. So I did find these people. Wow. Yeah. So I found them. And I knew I could talk to them. I just didn't want to pass along their new information to her, but I could talk to them. So I contacted them and I told them, as I'm sure you're aware, today is her 18th birthday. And they were very well aware that that was her 18th birthday. And I said, she did call. So they were overjoyed. They were still together. They did marry. They had no other children. Mm -hmm. um, now there's a biological component here because I don't know why they didn't have other children. But this young woman was told by a doctor she, she could not have children because she had some ovarian problem. And um, when we eventually found out from, from birth mother that she also had, this is a genetic problem. Mm -hmm. So again, another reason that's really nice to share you know, medical information. So um, we started out with talking, you know, it was, even though they had hoped for it, it was still kind of shocking for the birth family to hear that she did, she did, she did reach out. Um, and the way we broached this, because everyone has a lot of anxiety when there's a reunion. They live out of state, so they're not here. So a nice kind of dipping the toes in the water in a case like this is to have them write letters to each other and send pictures. <laughs> so I, I helped Jennifer to to draft the letter that she wanted, the things she would like them to know about her, and she included a picture, and we sent it through the agency, I sent it to them. They responded, sending pictures and all kinds of things. Very appropriate, lovely. So um, they haven't talked on the phone yet, we're working up with that. A lot of anxiety, it takes, it takes a while. And this has been going on for a year. So it, it sometimes takes that long because, you know, you have other stuff that happens in your life, too. And then everybody else has input. So, you know, her, her family 
they were a little threatened by this. So we, we worked in counseling about, you know, those feelings and how she was dealing with her family's reaction to this as well. Well, it seems like her family was threatened from the beginning, like you said, and that's kind of why we posed the question, like, well, what were they trying to protect you from? Rather than, like, why were mom and dad lying to you and being terrible people? You know, there was a reason why they were doing what they were doing. And knowing that the adopted, um, the birth parents, excuse me, um, you know, tried to, um, tried to get Jennifer back after placing her up for adoption, um, a really big indicator. Yeah. Yeah. And so I couldn't share all the information with her because I was only allowed to share the part that was allowed to be shared, which is a birth parent summary and didn't give all these details. So I could not share with her what the circumstances of the placement were. Mm -hmm. um, but what did happen is when she told her mother that she was in contact with the agency, her mother did disclose everything that happened. So it helped their relationship a little bit because then she felt like she could trust her mother and she said, my mother did tell me this, is that true? And I could confirm that yes, that, that was true. And I said, isn't that wonderful that she, you know, is finally to the point where she can share that with you. You know, and so that relationship, you know, you know it's working, it, it's better. It's a tough relationship that she has. Mm -hmm. The adoptive family has made several decisions along the way, parenting decisions that were, you know, maybe not completely on point. So, or not the least of which is not telling them. But she came, she had an assignment at school that said families are made in many different ways. Go home and find out if you came to the family through biology or adoption. And she went home and they said, oh, you were adopted. And so was your older brother. But don't worry, you're both biologically, you know, siblings. But not the younger one. Don't tell him. He still doesn't know. So it's still an ongoing thing. You know, we're still meeting, we're, there's still a lot of issues here. But very interesting case. Mm -hmm. Karen, how did uh, Mrs. Joe and Nancy, her mm -hmm. parents, how, how are they perceiving you, given that their sense of, of you know, the agency is that, you know, do, were they aware that, that, the, uh, that it could have been revoked? Um, probably not. Yeah. I'm guessing they didn't tell that to them. Yeah. Um, if they went to a lawyer, a lawyer would have told them that. So I don't know if they were aware. Yeah. Um, when I first contacted them, I, um, I, I disclosed to them that I had, you know, I'm, I had reviewed their file and I can appreciate how devastating this placement must have been for them. Um, uh, you know, unfortunately, no one is still at this agency that worked here at that time. Um, and that was actually a good thing for us, because I removed myself from the bad guys. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't part of it. Um, but what I could do was really, you know, empathize with them that this must have been the, probably one of the most difficult things that they've encountered in their lives. Um, and they appreciated that I acknowledged that. And um, I have a good relationship with them. So uh, we only talk by phone. But they're very appreciative and they're very appropriate. I told them, listen, she does not know the circumstances. I don't know how much she knows at this point about the circumstances of her placement. And they said, we don't want her, we will not discuss with her the circumstances of her placement unless she brings it up with us. But we don't want to paint her parents in a bad light. We want that relationship to be strong and intact. They love their child. They're still willing to be completely, like they want her to be feeling secure and good about her parents. So, yeah, really interesting. Um, any other questions about that, that one? It's <laughs> an interesting one. I mean, each one is very different and very interesting. The other, the other case study that we have is, uh, Brittany. What do I call her? Brittany. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we had a 16 year old girl named Brittany who was adopted. Um, she was adopted at nine months old and she was adopted from Pakistan. Um, she has five other siblings. Well, she's one of five. She's one of five. So, um, 
and during the time uh, the parent was talking to, <coughs> they, when they were adopting her, they weren't expecting to get pregnant. Yeah, so what happened so, with them is they, they were going for this international adoption and they were waiting to be able to take the baby from Pakistan and in the meantime, Sue gets pregnant. So they call the adoption agency, I'll give a quick one so, so you don't have to go through. So, I, I'll, so they call the adoption agency and say, yeah, we want to we bag out on this adoption because now we have this baby. And the, they, told, they reported to me that the adoption agency said, you can't do that, you committed. So they went to Pakistan not really too thrilled about it. Um, they took the baby from Pakistan to the United States and two months later she delivered a baby. So now we have these two girls that are basically the same age. <coughs> um, of the five children, she's the only adopted child. The others are all biological children. The family called the agency because they wanted to have a re-adoption uh, report submitted for the court. So. Sometimes when you're adopted out of country, you have to be readopted in the United States to have full citizenship here. Um, usually, people will do that right away. This child was 16, so clearly it wasn't really a, you know something you know that the family worried about too much. But now she wanted to get a driver's license, so she needed to have her credentials. She also wanted to get a passport to travel to. Pakistan on a church trip because she really wanted to go to where to see the place that she was born in. So they ordered the, the um, what's called an ACI, an adoption complaint investigation. It's a readoption. And I went out to the house thinking that this is going to be a very quick and easy interview with the family, interview with the child, write the report, send it in for the readoption. That's not what I found. So few things about this this girl is she was referred to in her family as the adopted child. This is my adopted sister. These are my sisters. That's my adopted sister. These are my children. That's my two daughters, uh, my adopted daughter, and my two sons. So she was. She felt very. Um, she felt some anger. She felt uh, disconnected. She wasn't part of the family. And there were a few things I think I gave in your review there. If you could share some of the things that her parents had said. Um, yeah, they always reported that Brittany had a little difficult child. And they reported, you know, they were probably said that she wasn't as smart as her biological children. And um, they thought it would be best for Brittany to find a place to stay in the summer to give the family like, a break. So they figured that was better to send her somewhere to somewhere so the rest Felt of the perfectly free saying this in front of everyone. Mm -hmm. In front of her and, and her siblings. And they blamed <coughs> all of the family's problems. That's right. <coughs> because dad was suggesting that she finds a place to live. She's 16 years old for the summer. I don't care where, she knew that's up to her. She needs to find, she needs to be gone for the summer. We need a break from her. She has no idea where she's going to go. She's calling friends. Can you think I can live with you for the summer? So I had to ask dad, are you saying that you are unwilling or unable to parent this child right now because I'm going to need to call the division. <laughs> You can't tell your child, get out, not at 16. So why do you need to do that? <coughs> so there's a lot of education with the family. She's the adopted child. Of, they said, well, in our defense, we tried, we keep trying to find another family for her. Oh my gosh. But, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> the adopted family said this? Yes. To 
biological family is not a part of this history, right? It says all these Right, there is a biological family. Yeah, I'm sorry. Like, all these um, oh um, my one of the things oh my we were talking God. about that we were really concerned about oh is gosh. like, like I know how you mentioned having um, um, adoptive parents screened for their diversity sensitivity and how willing they would be to like inter themselves in another culture and I feel like that wasn't done at all I agree <laughs> I like what were their motives was that even like question like what would, they what were they doing before I'm, I'm they I did adopted. right and then they were having trouble yeah. conceiving they wanted a big family so I guess they really wanted so they said well so they we want more them. children so I guess we're going to have to adopt but 18 years ago diversity wasn't an issue yeah artificial twinning wasn't an issue I just have a quick question. Are, is the adoption agency allowed to say, no, you committed, you have to have this kid? And shouldn't they I kind never of heard that. say, but like, she, you that's don't what want they said happened? But I don't know. I mean, they were working with some <laughs> international agency. I don't know. I can't imagine that. But right. I, that sounded bizarre to me. So, in your experience, uh, an adoptive <laughs> family, a potential adoptive family parents can opt out? at any time or prior to the placement? Or? Um, a potential adoptive family, even if they have a child placed in their home, until the adoption is finalized, they can opt out. Do you know anything about uh, like uh, rates of adopted children being placed for adoption again? Is that, ha is that common at all? No, it's not common. Most adoption, domestic adoptions especially, you know, no. Yeah. Re-adoptions aren't really. And to bring a child into the country and then look for a family to take, that's, I've never heard of that before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it was, it, was a, it was an unusual case. And so one of the goals for therapeutic goals was to educate the family a little bit, right? And um, to see what are the dynamics in this household? Who's leading the talk? Who's the identified patient? client and that can be fluid so we started out where she was the identified client right she's the one that we had to interview but it turns out the family wound up being the identified client and so we I did family therapy with them it was very interesting <laughs> so I knew that they mom and dad very resistant very resistant to everything dad especially we tried, they made us do counseling, uh, you're, that doesn't do anything, you know, this is just a waste of my time, she's a trouble kid, nothing's going to change that, like she's bad seed, right? So, we basically got dad on board by saying, well, maybe it won't be perfect, but let's see if we can make, you know, make the household run a little bit easier and have, have people work together, maybe a little bit of a spirit of cooperation just to make, because it seems like you guys sure have been through a lot. Because really, when you think about it, they're feeling like they have been carrying this burden for a long time, one that they never signed up for. So although it was challenging for me personally, I had to empathize with them too. It took a little time. <laughs> yeah. Were you um, a solo therapist in the counseling sessions, or did you have a co? No, it was just me. Um, um, so when they had to go pick her up after they told them that it's finalized, they have to, like, you can't back out of this. Right. Was it ever possible that they could just never have gone to Pakistan yeah. to, together? So what kind of sanctions can Pakistan put on that? None. You know? I, I don't, yes, I think they could have just not gone. I, I don't really understand that. <coughs> I don't know. I mean, who knows what would happen, but... They yeah, they, you can't. <laughs> like like we said before, and you're not under a legal obligation until an adoption is finalized, and it wasn't finalized in Pakistan yet. So I really, I never really understood that piece of it. Like something wasn't right there. But that was actually the least of the issues at that point. What happened back then? Right now, the issue is this kid's in this house. She's the scapegoat. And how can we? Everybody feels like they're, everybody has more of a burden than the next one. <laughs> so, you know, how do we connect with everybody and the family as a whole? So they were so detached, all of them. Um, it was kind of a strange group. So 
one of the first things I did with them was to get them to have some sort of understanding or awareness of each other. And we were starting at the ground level here. And so when I came over and I knew that I had to start this pretty light and airy because dad's not going to be on board with anything too heavy. So we're going to play games. I'm playing a game. I don't want to play any games. Or, you know, so it's simple. We're going to go outside. Everybody outside. Everybody on the lawn. Okay. Work with me. I'm just a kooky counselor. <laughs> so I did, uh, those of you who had Dr. Hall, this, is, this will sound familiar to you. So okay. So I'm going to give you a choice and then depending on where I point, whatever your preference is, go to that side of the yard. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I started that. Chocolate, vanilla, summer, winter, skiing, swimming. And I just went through, and they were running back and forth, running back and forth. They started laughing or, you know. And then it was a game of who remembers what people liked. So you got points if you remembered what people liked. And then it got a little bit trickier. Then it got um, things like um, maybe what your preferences are for chores. Okay, uh, washing dishes or cleaning the bathrooms um, and, and that kind of thing. And then it got into um, hugs or kisses. Um, saying good morning, saying good night. Um, and just a variety of things like that that might bring up more emotional stuff. So we played this for a little while, and then and then the next session it was what do we remember from that? Got a little prize if we remember something. Um, we worked on division of of um, mm -hmm. chores in the household because mom felt like she does everything. Oh, you know, she was everybody was a martyr. There was a family of martyrs, so you know everybody hated doing what they did. So okay, let's bring it together. Okay, what do you hate least? Doing the dishes or washing the bathrooms? Okay, well. Well, well, you know, Jennifer usually wa washes the bathrooms pretty nice. So do you mind doing that, Jennifer? No, I'd rather do that than cook the dinner. Okay, who likes to cook? Well, our identified client liked to cook. She actually was going to culinary school because the family thought she's not smart enough to go to college. And they didn't have a college fund for her. They had the other kids. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is good. Better, better. Yeah. Was, this was a challenging case. Were they as strange or as the parents? Initially, yes. And then an interesting thing happened in the family therapy. The siblings started connecting with each other and with her. And she became more of an empathetic character to them because they started saying, yeah, you know, that really isn't right that you, you know, you do always make her do that. Mm -hmm. Or she always does that. And they started protecting her. Mm -hmm. It was very interesting what happened. So the. <laughs> What happened was, we find out is that, you know, after time, the problem was relationship with the couple. Oh. Sound familiar? Yeah. Family couple <laughs> <and students? laughs> okay. Because I was thinking if they sent her away for the summer, they might really be surprised that even with her gone, That's right. they still have problems. That's right. The problem was the couple. I think they might be divorced now. They were kind of headed in that direction. Wow. So the problem was the couple. And the good news is that I, I did eventually recommend the readoption for the, no other reason alone, but this child needed to have legitimate citizenship. She deserved it. Um, and she did have then a support system with her siblings. The parents then became their own, they had their own issues there and you know, we were recommending marriage counseling for them if they chose to do that. Uh, so as it turned out, mom had to find a place for the summer. <laughs> um, <laughs> somebody was leaving for the summer, but um, it, was, it, was, um, it was a challenge to counter transference. Mm -hmm. And a lot of adoption issues will be. Like it's really important to, to be able to remove yourself and to be to be able to allow yourself to see people in a way that you can empathize with all the members of the triad. Because they share similar things. They share loss, all of them. Um, they share a stigma, all of them. Even the adoptive family, who are generally revered, like, oh, aren't you a hero? You adopted a child, you know. 
it's kind of a weird thing that we do as a society. We say, aren't they a hero that they're adopting these children? Well, you know what? Heroes are waiting one to two years to be able to adopt a child, so there's something not right about that picture. There's more people that want to adopt than babies that are available, so it's kind of the other way around. And we are in the business of placing, uh, uh, in the business of furnishing children for parents who want to be parents. <coughs> We're in the business of placing children in homes where they can grow and grow. There's a difference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we have to make that distinction for our families, too. Any questions about our Brittany case? You're still in contact with her? I'm not. And that's like with other areas of adoption, I would love to have updates from people. Some people do keep in touch and some don't. And that one I haven't heard from. Those are really good case studies. Yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah. Um, so just kind of to wrap it up, there are some things like to understand the value of what adoption counseling and training and that can do for you. This field is going to explode in two years. Last year, Governor Christie signed a law in the state of New Jersey allowing access for adoptees and their families to original birth certificates. That's the name of your birth parents. So a lot of people are waiting for January 1, 2017 to get information. And we have birth parents that are in their 60s, 70s, 80s, 40s, what, you know, who never thought that this would happen, who are unaware, by the way, that this law has been passed. So we will have people freaking out and needing to talk to somebody. These issues that have been buried are going to be resurfacing in the next few years. And it's really important as professionals that we have some understanding of you know, how we can best help clients, because it's coming, there's a wave, it's coming. Um, the other thing that is affecting our role as counselors is the advances in medicine. So now, you know, adoption was the kind of traditional way, you know, path to parenthood, but now we've got embryo implant, you know. We have um, surrogates. And those are relationships that have to be worked out. In the surrogates case, now, does that need to have the like, legal binding mm -hmm. contract yes. before? Surrogates, there's a lot of contracts involved before surrogacy. Ironically, there's no home study needed. It's just a gap. Will any mandated counseling happen with that um, access to original birth certificate then? No, right now they're not talking about any mandated counseling. They passed this law, it's also unfunded. <laughs> so it's going to be really <laughs> tricky. So mandated counseling, you know, it's unfunded. So I don't know how that's going to work. So I'm meeting actually with the Department of Health this week, on Thursday. Um, because I knew in my agency that we would have to be addressing, when I saw this law passed, I said, it's coming, I'm preparing. So I started immediately, when we work with birth parents, telling them, this is a law that's coming, this is what it means for you, I want you to fill out the paperwork now as far as consent, because what will happen is that birth parents have to choose what kind of contact they want, either direct, through an intermediary, um, or prefer no contact. And that those records will be kept in the state. Um, so I drafted some forms up until um, December 31st, 2016. A birth parent that has already placed a child can redact her name from the original birth certificate. But not after that. At least that's why how it's going right now. So I have the form, I, I developed these forms for people to, to fill out now figuring, they're just, the state's going to tell us we need them. And and so when our office licensing came in, um, I showed them the forms that I had developed that we're already implementing, they're using for the whole state. And I was invited to go to the Department of Health this week to test a program for online access um, for information for birth parents and, and adoptees. It's, it's, it's going to be a very big thing. They're, they have right now in the state of New Jersey, 400,000 birth certificates that will become available. Wow. With no funding. 
<laughs> so like it's it's very tricky. But you know, you will probably hear about this in the next, you know, in the next year and a half before it before it hits. And you may have clients, I don't care what area of counseling you're in, you, you know, you may have clients that are gonna be, you know, affected by this. Is that law just New Jersey? Or this law is in New Jersey. New Jersey's one of the first states that is doing this. Other states are asking to look at what we're doing, and this will be the way of the future. Because we're not getting, you know, access to information isn't going to be less. <coughs> is it only access for U.S. birth certificates, or could they still get access from international birth It's birth certificates that are held in the Jersey. So people of any age can see their birth certificate? You have to be 18 years old. Oh, okay. And the adoptee has to be 18 years old. There are, there are authorized persons that have access to it. So it's not just the adoptee. It's the adoptee, the adoptee's spouse, siblings, parents, adoption agency, or attorneys. They have to be authorized persons. But any of them, have, all of them, have to wait until the actual adoptee is 18 before they can submit um, the application. Interesting, right? Interesting yeah. stuff. I mean, the, all the people that thought the closed adoptions is just going to, it's going to be hard for some people. Yeah. And it's going to be really scary for some people who thought that this was something. I mean, imagine having placed a child, you know, 50 years ago. You've got grandchildren and great grandchildren, and no one's ever known this. And then having this information come out. So whether you go into adoption counseling specifically or not, all counselors are going to need to face this with this law being passed that could inherently just come up, you know, mm -hmm. bring uh, existential issues up for you know any of the clients that this, that this affects. It could it could affect anyone. And yeah. so how could it impact? Say let's let's take substance use for instance. How could it affect some clients that are in substance use? Okay, maybe the knowledge that their mother had another child that they have a sibling out there that they never met and this is so like overwhelming for them, it might trigger something for their use. So you may be meeting with someone that says, well, I started using again, but it was after I found out, you know, that this happened. And I don't know what to do with this. And, you know, so, I mean, that's just one area. Increasing depression and perceiving, <laughs> not being Anxiety, alive. depression, I mean, just. <coughs> Sharon, yeah. could you speak yes. to the group about like your personal experience with how you landed in this role? You're speaking yeah. like, yeah. You've been um, in this industry for 20 years, yeah, and, and, uh, but you, how did you come upon this role and how did you embrace it and what does it mean to you? Yeah, um, well, it means the world to me, really. Um, and I stumbled upon it in my internship. So when I came here to Monmouth, I had had a degree 100 years ago from my bachelor's degree in psychology. And I worked um, for years at Planned Parenthood at, and they used to call us um, problem pregnancy counselors. So it was about people that were unexpectedly pregnant and didn't know what to do. So a lot of these, this is after Roe v. Wade, so a lot of these ended in terminations at Planned Parenthood. Or there would be referrals for uh, social services. But there was no real, we had nobody to call if somebody decided to um, parent, they could do that, but nobody to call for adoption. Like we, there was no reference for that. And so when I came to Monmouth and I knew that marriage and family counseling was my, my interest. Um, so I tried to seek out internships that would involve those populations. And I saw the adoption agency on the list and I thought, you know, I would have liked to have had another option for some of my clients at Planned Parenthood. This, this is kind of the other side of it. I'd like to see what this is all about. And um, I just stopped by, it's in Red Bank, knocked on the door, unannounced, like now, now, no, that's a big no, no. But um, I did, and the owner of the, the founder of the agency happened to answer the door, it's locked doors. And um, I went in, I said, I was you know, an intern at Monmouth, I was looking for opportunities for internships, I'm very interested, and we talked a little bit about what I did before. And she said, um, mm -hmm. well, we don't have, we have, you know, we have a small agency, we have one intern now, but you know, next year, we'll have an opening. I said, great. So after the meeting, I did what nobody does anymore. I wrote her a card. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Old school. Yes, yes, and I mailed nice. it. <laughs> and I said, yeah, I'm the very mature intern <laughs> that you met. And um, so 
so then when the year came up and it was getting close to it, I, um, I wrote another card and I said, it's me, it's the old school intern, you know, I'm just wondering if you have an opportunity and I got a call. Nice. So I started my internship there. Um, I kept my internship there through my other, with my other internships. I piggybacked them all, but I stayed at the adoption agency. So I worked with um, the YMCA outreach program, working families through the division. Um, I worked with Dr. Pico for a year at uh, Rounds of Fairhaven, but I kept the adoption agency through all of it. And because the hours at the adoption agency were flexible, and you could see clients at night, and you could do one group sessions, you know, during the weekends, it, it worked for me. So I, when, I, when I graduated, I was offered a job as a caseworker, per diem, and um, I took it and, and took the work that I could, you know, what I could get. And um, they liked the work that I did. They liked the reports that I did. I'm, you know, attention to detail kind of person. And um, so they said they would give me all the birth parent work because social workers dominate this field, by the way. They didn't like working with the birth families because they cried. Because <laughs> they cried. I don't know what to do with that when they cried. So I was okay with the crying, you know, I was all right, you know. So I said, no, I really, I like the birth parent work. I think it's really interesting. I, I could sit with someone and, and I could be there for someone at that time. I knew that I had that in me and it, and it worked for me. So they said, well, we're going to give you all of our birth parent work. And I said, awesome, this is great. So I was pretty busy. Um, unfortunately, I was busy before my um, LAC came in, so none of those hours counted <laughs> at that time because you have to wait. That clock doesn't start cooking until you get that paper in your hand. Um, and then um, we had there was some change in personnel, and they they needed a casework supervisor. So they said, "Would you be willing to take that on too? Because you're you know you're." You're kind of talking, because I did all this research at Monmouth. I did an independent study here on adoption counseling because it wasn't part of the family counseling, uh, you know. So I had all this research. I, I had all this knowledge. I had the experience of the agency. And I was doing um, some of the trainings for the other counselors anyway. And so they said, do you want to just, you know, you're doing the same thing. You're just basically kind of overseeing what other people do, check people's reports and give feedback. And I said, sure. So I got hired as a casework supervisor, Hopefully and then hmm? Hopefully more money. Uh, I got more money. Okay, okay. Right. Still, you know, you're not raking it in. I'll tell you that. You're not no, raking it no, in. no, you know. And then there was again another shift in personnel and the direction the agency was going, and licensing got involved because our executive director did some things that were not exactly on the up and up. So the agency was in danger of closing. Um, I, along with a couple of other people and board members, came up with a plan. And the plan, unfortunately, had to involve me taking a role licensing said, you have to have 30 hours a week, an executive director on site, and you have to have a casework supervisor 30 hours a week on site. Um, and they have to have certain qualifications. And so we gave a couple of ideas people that could fill in until I did identify someone that could be an executive director starting June 1. And they said, well, it still has to be filled permanently now. We'll let the agency stay open if you're willing to do all the jobs. So I said, wow, that's great. Because, oh, we can't pay you. <laughs> you have to work six weeks and not get paid until the thing that, you know, gets ramped up. So I thought, well, collecting those hours for the LPC, I'll stay. Wow. So I stayed in the capacity of executive director and casework supervisor for six weeks, and now I'm back to just being casework supervisor and, and doing that sort of thing, which I, that's really what I like. That's, that's my passion. But the good news is, when you're working for a small agency, this kind of stuff happens. The benefit for me was if I ever want to open a nonprofit age, adoption agency, I know exactly what I need to do now, because I've had these different roles there. So I've had... I've had I've been privy to all the things that are necessary, what you need to do for clients, what you need to do to be in business. Because those of you who have aspirations of having a private practice, and I'm one of them, you know, that's a whole other ball. 
So it, it gave me a lot of experience in, you know, in what needs to be done on a state level with your office of licensing. Um, so it was really good experience for me. And this is also hopefully inspiration for any of the current students that are currently enrolled in the program. Right. If you're taking your practicum or your internship to push past your regular boundaries of comfort, get out of your comfort zone, try something new. This was really yeah. completely random because for Because we you, right? it this was random was for me, and now I train people. So just to keep in the back of your minds, if this is something when you graduate, also I mean we talk about internships and practicum, but when you graduate and you're looking for work. A lot of the work that you may connect with is per diem work initially while you still have that LAC. Mm -hmm. So you're looking to gain those hours. You can be trained in adoption training. We take per diem workers and I really want to have counselors at this agency because this is counseling work. And, and social work has tremendous value and I have a lot of respect for the social workers. I really do, especially the LCSWs have that clinical piece. But social workers tend to connect people with services. Mm -hmm. um, they fall short of this work. We need counselors in this. Mm -hmm. This is a count, and you know, the uh, the social work, uh, the board of social work has such a presence in the state of New Jersey. They just dominate everything. Our manual of requirements requires mm -hmm. that my position be held by a social worker. Well, I'm not a social worker. So my agency, when they wanted to put me in this role, said. You have to apply for a special dispensation to get a social work degree grandfathered in because your bachelor's degree was you know, back in the day. So I, I, all right, I, I put in for the certified social work grandfathered in paperwork and I got from the state, why would you do that? Your degree is so much, is so far beyond that. So I said, because they're requiring this to fill the position. So the other thing I'm doing right now, they did give me a waiver, by the way. They put me in the licensing, gave me a waiver, but they didn't like it. <laughs> so they're rewriting the manual of requirements right now for adoption agencies, foster care. Um, it's, a big, it's basically any child placing agency. Mm -hmm. So I raised my hand. I went in on that meeting because counselors should be in this. So this is my new goal, is to get counselors as you know one of the professions that's recognized and they're not yet. Talk about advocacy for the profession, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Absolutely. Good. So consider it. Mm -hmm. awesome. The other thing I'd like to do, because like I said, there's no there are no universities that I can find in the country mm -hmm. that offer this. None. So I'd Maybe like to be able to do online classes. courses, you know, that, that can mm -hmm. work with different yeah. Mm -hmm. Because this could be a whole course. I mean, I'm, I feel like I'm giving you little bits and pieces tonight, um, but there's a lot of there's a lot to this, and every case is different. These aren't two bizarre they are bizarre cases, but they're all you know kind of they're all kind of you know, involved. It's it's a lot of stuff to put together. It's, it's family counseling. It's you're bringing two separate and distinct families together for a relationship that will sustain a lifetime. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.